Greetings ladies and mentalgens and welcome to today's reddit series video from the subreddit hfy called chapter 6 training mission Jim I have some bad news said Skawa we were standing in his office having run from the training room Plant and I stood relaxed our breathing even and calm the Krantum was wheezing with a slight bit his breath hissing between his clenched teeth Jem's breath clicked when he inhaled, but his body was rigid and straight, so I assumed that he was fine. It had been a long run, perhaps a mile, and we had gone fast, and wondered how far the tunnels extended under the mountain, probably thousands of miles. Regardless, we stood before Skawa, who had a sheet of paper held in his hands. He continued, Buria has been invaded by the swarm. They landed troops just a day ago. From what our intelligence operatives were able to gather, they are only a couple thousand troops, a small force to conquer a world. I would have expected more. It wouldn't have to be, General. My people do not have a standing army and the population of Buria is small. If I may ask, what are your plans on the situation? Jem looked troubled. I did not blame him. His own planet was being attacked by the Empire of Slavers, and his family, even if he was separated from them, was in harm's way. I am afraid that I can do little, our forces are needed elsewhere, and I do not wish to start a full-on war with the Empire. Not yet. We don't have the manpower or the resources. Skawa set the paper down and looked at Grim. General, a small team like the War Hunters could land and disrupt the Swarm's forces. They could evacuate as much of the population as possible. Jem protested. He looked near panic. I had only been married for a year and since divorced with no children, but I knew how Jem must be feeding. Flint undoubtedly knew far too well. I cannot send the hunters. They are needed for other purposes, Scour said, sounding resigned. Then I will go myself, said Jem. I can get in and out before the swarm know I'm there. Don't try to stop me. I know what you did for your family and I intend to save mine. Scour held up his hand, his golden eyes reflecting the light from the ceiling. I have no intention of stopping you. In fact, I am sending you with help, you three. He said, looking at Clint and Cantum and me. You passed the combat evaluation, correct? We nodded. Good. As you should know, every new recruit goes through a training mission to see how they respond to combat. I do not think that it will be a problem with you three, but one must follow protocol. You three, along with the two or three from the War Hunters, will accompany Captain Mulfuni to Breria and cause as much damage to the swarm as possible. He looked back at Jem. Will this suffice? Jem nodded. Thank you, General. Who from the Hunters will be joining? I thought Dwyer's and Dark would be enough. Jem's face confirmed that they would indeed be a great help. I couldn't help but almost feel sorry for the swarm. We were about to attack them with a force consisting of three hardened veterans of an elite squad, the Jihad who fights the destruction incarnate and the man called Clint Stone. There were thousands of them, but Berea was a hostile place. Jem knew it like the back of his hand and the swarm had no idea what they were getting into. But I'm afraid that you'll have to take one of the scouting ships. The dragon will be in use. I assume the dragon was the war hunter's ship. I thought it funny. They named it after the Lord Fuzi, the animal Clinton called a dragon. Then spoke up. Susan is free, General. We can take her. She'll get us there twice as fast as anything else, too. Scour looked awfully at his desk. Very well. Take Susan. Now get going. You won't have much time. Jem nodded and headed for the door. We followed. I found the situation slightly amusing. We hadn't been here for more than a day, and here we were, about to go drive to the swarm off a planet. It had been a good choice to join the rebellion. The six of us stood in front of Susan as the bay ramp lowered. Twice turned out to be a large goon with a colorful blue tattoo running from his ear to the corner of his mouth. Dyke was a thickly built gurk, his scaled head almost level with mine. His shoulders were wider than mine, though. Both were dressed in distinctly non-military outfit. Dake in a large, dark green suit that looked like it was one piece. And Joyce had a deep red pants and a stark white shirt. Both wore military-grade boots, though. You came in that thing, said Dake, his faint hint of amusement in his voice. Despite his gurkish, his voice did not have the hissing accent common to his race. You're either very brave or very foolish. Clint bristled at the comment, No one talks bad about his baby. 
She's the best ship to ever fly. Say another word and you get to fly it on the howl. Dake grunted, but he did not respond. I could see where his thoughts came from, though. From the outsider's perspective, Susan looked like she would fall apart at any moment. A large body tapering into a narrow point. She looked like she'd been cobbled together with spare parts from a junkyard, which she had been. But Clint had put them together in such a way that she would outlast even the most carefully constructed shipyard constructs. The ramp thumped down and we boarded carrying the supplies Jim had provisioned from the quartermaster, mostly food and water. There was a smattering of weapons amongst the food canisters. Dwice and Dank both had a large plasma rifles hung around their shoulders, and Jem had a specially crafted rifle. The canton had produced a pair of pistols and a rifle from places unknown, and Clint and I had the caches on Susan and our fists. Set our supplies down there, Clint said, gesturing to the far side of the bay. I'll get us up in the air and Tedex will give you the tour. We climbed up into the cabin and I turned to the passengers. Well, as you can see, you're standing in the bay, largest room on the ship, and full of things that you do not want to touch. I waved at one of the benches set in the far wall. I could see the bloodstains from the thief. I could never be able to wash those out, despite numerous tries. Set on the now were a collection of metal parts and half-finished weapons that looked like there was going to be a gun. That's where Clint builds his toys during long trips. Don't touch. Up there, I gestured towards the stairs Clint had climbed up is the rest of the ship. Continuing straight, you get to the cabin. It seats four. Turn at the top and you get to the rooms. Several sleeping rooms, a waste station and a shower, and the armory. I clasped my hands in front of me. Any questions? Joyce grunted and set a big bag down on the floor, and the rest of them dispersed amongst the bay, setting up their own little space. Not a very talkative bunch. I was glad about that. I did not have much to talk about. I turned back and climbed into the cabin. How are we doing? I asked Clint. Just left the gravity well, he responded. Entering warp now. With a whisper, Susan made a th jump and we accelerated far beyond the speed of light. I settled into my chair and waited for one of the soldiers to ask when we would make the jump. I did not have to wait for long. The canton climbed up the stairs and settled himself into one of the chairs behind me. When do we leave? He asked in a strange rumbling voice. Clint looked at me, and I looked at him. We both turned back to the canton and said together, We already have. Clint pointed to the viewpoint, and the canton's eyes squinted as he struggled to see out the window, looking for stars. They widened when he realized what he was looking at and his twisted tunnel of wall space. That's... that's not possible, he said, and shock written all over his face. Clint grinned. You better believe it. I told you my baby was the best. He patted the panel in front of him, and the canton struggled for his voice. Finding it, he said, The things they say about you, how can you compile anything? They're all true. I don't know what you heard, I asked the canton. What's your name, by the way? You know ours, it's only fair that we know yours. Name is Druan Rel, he said. They say that you can make things that no one else has seen before. The ship that can go light speed outside warp. He glanced around, realizing if it was true, he was in that very ship. Clint nodded. You're standing in her. He had a touch of pride in his voice. If a touch meant an ocean, he was always proud of the things he made. If they worked. If they didn't, they never existed. Did you really make yourself an arm? Dunwell asked apprehensively. Clint pulled off his glove, which he had been wearing for the entirety of our time in Aldermere, and rolled his left sleeve up back to the elbow. His metal arm glinted dully in the light, the grey metal absorbing the light. The strange, twisted cords that made his skin of his lower arm bunched up and jumped as Clint made a fist and wiggled his fingers. Dunrell looked on his eyes wider than he when he had seen the warp tunnel. Technically, I didn't make it. He was interrupted by Dake, who had clambered up the stairs, making a great deal of noise with his boots' heels. When are we going to... Whoa... Whether he was talking about Clint's hand or the fact that the ship was flying through warp tunnel was not very clear. The next part was, The stories are true then. Did you really cut off your arm so that it would be harder to fight you? No. Why would I do that? exclaimed Clint. He looked baffled at the thought. It was an awful fighting with one hand. A mercenary always killed me. Dake's face darkened. I know. He was my cousin. The cabin went still I tensed, ready to strike Dake if they made a move. Dake glanced around and noticed the looks on our faces. 
He held up his hands. Relax, it was a joke. We did not stop watching him, but I did relax my guard a bit. He turned around and walked back down the stairs, grumbling something about no one understanding great comedy. Jem walked up behind him. Don't worry about him. He's a famous for his poor attempts at humor. But, but he's a master at the rifle of his. No better sniper. He said as admiration in his voice. Jem sat down in a lost open chair with a sign. I've heard rumors about this ship. Is she as fast as to say? Master, probably, I said. We'll be in Biria in four hours. Four hours? Said Jem incredulously, his voice clicking. That's not possible. I turned to face him fully. When it comes to Clint Stone, impossible does not exist. I could see Clint's mouth turn up into a little grin, but I did not say anything about it. It was never good to stoke his ego. Jem shook his head and focused his eyes in front of his hands. He must have been very worried. I had never seen his eyes settle in one place for more than a second, and never two at once. We'll get there in time, I told him. He nodded, but I could still see my words did little to calm him. What's the plan when we get there? Dunral asked. Jem looked up, his eyes once again darting in every direction. It seemed war took his mind off his family, which was the reason he joined the rebellion in the first place. We'll need to scout out the enemy, and then we'll devise a plan based on the information. Hey, Captain! A voice called from the bay. It's time for my pong! Give me a second, Jem shouted back. He looked at us. War hunters have a tradition before every mission, when we can get the time to play a card game called Mapong. You guys in? We agreed and went down to the bay. Mapong turned out to be a rather simple card game, and we played several rounds. You start with a regular deck of cards, the Emperor, and the Regent, and the Twins, and the number cards 1 through 12, all through the five suites. Each player is given seven cards and the rest is put into the middle of the circle. One player starts and they ask the other players if they have a card that matches the one in their cards. If a match is found, it is put to the side and counts as a point. If they do not get a match, the other player asks and tells the first player Mapong, and they reach into the pile in the center and take out a random card. This continues around the circle until the last matches have been found. The player with the most matches wins. When the rules were explained to Clint, looked greatly amused. But I did not see why. We played for several rounds of the game, but it was not just the game itself that caused the war hunters to play it. There was also a sense of light-hearted amusement in the circle, and it was what drew the hunters to the game. When you were a hardened warrior fighting the battle against a vastly superior foe, and you faced death at every turn, you took what enjoyment you could from life. There was also a light sharing of history with each other. Dick told us about his family, and he was going to be a father in a few months. This was interjected by poor he tries at humor, but they were accepted. Dunral told us about his life before the rebellion, when he was a member of the Utah militia, before it was disbanded. Clint and I told stories of our exploits. Jim told us of his version of what happened when Clint and I visited his planet. Dwight did not speak much. We were in the middle of our fourth round when a beeping noise came from the cabin. We're here, Clint said. I hope that you enjoyed, and if you did, please consider subscribing. If you wish to support the author, there is a link to the original story, so pop over there and give him your support. If you wish to support this channel, however, there are a few ways to do so. The best and easiest would be to share this video with other people as well as liking, subscribing, and leaving a comment. All of these things tell the algorithm that this channel is at least vaguely interesting, and that may share it with other people. If you wish to support the channel in some other manner, watching my other videos would also help tremendously. Or, if you really, really, really like, there is a link down below to leave a tip, or to join the Patreon. Any and all support is very much appreciated. And I hope that you all have a good one until the next time, and I'll see you then. Cheers.